Hello, my dear friends. This is Yaakov Walby. I hope you're doing well. Three years ago, I interviewed my sister, Esther Kaplan, about what it was like to lose a child when her and her husband, AJ, lost their son, Shlomo, at a very young age. He was only a few months old. And I spoke to her about the experience of loss and bereavement and grief and what that was like. And that was almost immediately, it was a few months only after that horrific tragedy. And we had a discussion about it. It was a open discussion. It was a frank discussion. I think it was a very inspiring and enlightening one. And that was released on the podcast three years ago. This week, I'm releasing a part two of that discussion. Three years later, my sister and I sat down for a conversation, a second conversation about the same topic and what had happened to our family afterwards. But before I release the new episode, I received some good advice from a podcast listener to re-release the first episode, and that is the one you're listening to right now. And tomorrow, the day after I release this episode or re-release this episode, we're going to have part two of our discussion with Esther Kaplan. So this is part one. This is a re-release of what we talked about three years ago. And tomorrow, please God, I'm going to release the new episode. I thank you all for listening. As always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Hello, friends. This is Rabbi Yaakov Walby, and this is a very special episode of the podcast uh, for several reasons. Number one, because I'm in Jerusalem, the holy city. Uh, Today is Sunday, March 11th, and uh, several days ago, on Thursday, my eldest brother, Eliezer Eli, he made a wedding for his daughter, my niece, Shoshana, and thus I flew in to Israel to celebrate and it was festivities were wonderful and the excitement was incredible and I'm happy I came. Uh, but today is Sunday and today I'm sitting in the home of my sister, Esther, Esther Kaplan. And we're going to be talking about something that we generally don't talk about enough. It's one of those things that a lot of people are uncomfortable to talk about. Uh, it's, it's an issue that is, is quite painful and quite tragic. Uh, because, uh, sadly, my sister Esther and her husband, AJ, they went through the most painful experience that a parent can go through uh, when they lost their son Shlomo, uh, who was only several months old, uh, suddenly crib death. And my hope is to discuss this, the whole episode, the whole story. We'll start from the beginning and I think there's several benefits. First of all, I think for people, thankfully, who have not experienced this kind of tragedy, uh, it's always a black box. They don't know what people are going through. And it's it's maybe a little bit awkward. It's a little bit uncomfortable. What do you say to a bereaving parent? What do you not say to a bereaving parent? What are they going through? What are they feeling? And I think that's beneficial for everyone. Um, but I also think it's beneficial for us as well to hear a a a spiritual and religious and Torah perspective on dealing with tragedy in its immediate aftermath and beyond. Like now we're about, we're several months uh, removed, uh, almost a year, I would say, eight, eight or nine months. What would you say, Esther? It's about nine months. About nine months uh, since the tragedy. And of course, the, the, you experience the tragedy in, in stages and, and things change over time. So hopefully we're going to hear a little bit about that, uh, uh, that perspective as well. So Esther, thank you so much for hosting me in your home. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. You're excited to be here? Well, you live here. Yeah, I'm excited <laughs> to be here with you. <laughs> well, I'm excited to be here with you as well. And uh, Esther is my uh, younger sister. How much younger are you than me? Five years, maybe. Five years apart? Five, well, five years apart. So that's just my little sister, my baby sister. And uh, uh, we grew up in Muncie, New York. And uh, now you live here in, in Jerusalem. And how long have you been living here for? Nearly five years. Nearly five years. And you like living here? It's very special to be here. So, so Esther and AJ are pioneers. 
they are, even though they're both American, they are living in Israel because Israel is home to some of the greatest Talmudic institutions that our planet has ever seen. And the Mir Yeshiva, uh, the Yeshiva of which that I too am an alumnus is, uh, proud to have, uh, AJ Kaplan as a member in their ranks. So you got married in 2013. Correct. In June. And right afterwards you moved to Israel? Yeah, in August. So in August you moved to Israel. So it means in August 2018 is going to be five years. Yep. Now, when was Sarah born? Sarah was born in April 2015. So several years after you got here. Sarah's born. Sarah is an adorable and delicious and sweet and cute girl with the most <laughs> robust, delicious cheeks that you could ever pinch. And uh, she's actually right now in in childcare. Yes. In the same building that we're in here today. <laughs> okay. That's why we love living here. <laughs> quite convenient downstairs neighbor and when was when was shlomo born shlomo was born february 10th 2017 so a little more than a year ago yeah he was my birthday present three days after my birthday he was born i didn't think i would have him for like another week and then he just decided that's it i'm ready to go (laughs) he was born a little bit early earlier than anticipated four days yep (laughs) and uh tell me a little bit about him because he was a remarkable remarkable baby yeah, what's interesting is I wasn't the only one who thought so, because like, mothers usually think that their babies are amazing and mm-hmm. special mm-hmm. and beautiful. But I heard it from other people, like all over. I even felt <laughs> when we went... So, okay, I'll start from the beginning. Um, Shlomo was born on a Friday morning. In just the qu- quickest way, he was just... I couldn't fall asleep at night, and I kept feeling like, I don't know, am I having contractions? Am I not? Am I yes, am I not? And, uh, AJ's sister had given birth the day before on Wednesday. So they were going to, on Wednesday nights, so they were going to have a breast on Thursday morning. And when that, when that baby was born, AJ told me, okay, just wait till after Shabbos so that if it's a boy, my father could be here for the breast. Just wait till after Shabbos. And here I am. It's Thursday, three o'clock in the morning. I can't sleep. I'm tossing and turning and. <laughs> at four o'clock, I wake up AJ. I'm like, AJ, I'm really sorry to do this to you, but I think I might be in labor. <laughs> we got to the hospital and he was born at 8 11. Um, on Friday morning. Friday morning. February 10th. February 10th. 2017. Mm-hmm. And AJ spent another couple hours with me, went home to arrange the Shalom Zachar. And it was just me and Shlomo over Shabbos, that first Shabbos of his life. And I was so attached to him that first minute he was born. Sometimes, you know, it takes a little while or that first hour or two. Or I, like the minute he was born, I was like, wow. He was just, he was just so warm and beautiful and amazing. And then that day was actually in the Hebrew date was Yadal Shvat. And we were undecided about what we would name a son if it was to be a boy. We were, weren't sure because I have. You didn't know what what gender baby was. I was pretty sure it was a boy. I had this feeling about it, a really strong feeling. But I said, you know, if it's a boy, who are we going to name it? I have two grandfathers, and who passed away, and I didn't know who I would want to name it for. And then that day, I opened up the Tehillim for Yadalid. And the first word on there was Lashlomo. I said, okay. I called up AJ after Shabbos. I'm like, AJ, it's Shlomo. He's like, okay. <laughs> it was the quickest conversation ever. <laughs> so so just to explain that for those who didn't understand what exactly happened there, the book of Psalms, the book of Tehillim is broken up for people who want to say it once a month. And thus, the 14th day of the month, the very first word is Lashlomo, and that solved your questions. <laughs> Yeah, so that was pretty simple. And um it just uh, there was something about him. I don't even know what it was. He was there just was perfect. something about him that was yeah, that was just very pure, very I even had felt while I was pregnant with him that I like should watch my like watch what I see, watch what I hear. There was something about him that was very special that was it, it became a part of me when he was within me. 
And then his bris was also just, it was a Friday morning. My father-in-law made it. He brought in my husband, AJ's three brothers with him to the bris. That was very special for us. And people were just, it was just uh, um unique, very unique. It was a very special bris. Uh, people were just saying, it was so happy. It was so beautiful. It was so, I don't know why. And that's just how he was. And then a few weeks later, we went uh, back to New York to be with my parents and in-laws for Pesach. And my father kept saying, you have to hide him. You can't bring him outside. He's so beautiful. You can't bring him outside. People would say comments like that about him. He's unique. He's special. There's something about him. I don't know. And another strange thing was that I had this. I was very frantic about him. I would go check up on him when he was sleeping you know, every 15 minutes I could go at some points. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was God preparing me for what was coming. Maybe it wasn't. I, I don't know. But I, I felt like I had to pray for him to live. It was very strange because he was he was perfectly healthy. This is something you didn't feel like with, with no, Sarah. No, I didn't feel that with Sarah. And in a way, when it happened, I part of me wasn't even surprised. Part of me was in shock because I couldn't believe it actually came true. It actually happened. And part of me was like, oh, okay. I guess I was right. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe those things are connected. You know, we believe that we're sent here for a purpose. You know, if you accept the idea of God, you accept the idea of uh, of of there being some meaning to life. So traditionally, we say in Judaism that the man is born with a certain flaw. And thus, the objective of life is to try to fix it. Well, if some man is born perfect, and everyone seems to be commenting that there's perfection there, then maybe there's only something slight that they need to fix, or whatever that is. Well, of course, we have no idea. Maybe even just time. M- maybe that's it. And when the mission is 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 complete, then there's they're ushered back to where they really need to be. And of course, it's not easy for for you to hear that. Yeah. But you know, I think you're, I think the concept is very right and true. And it, I think it's as, it's as simple as it is complicated. What do you mean? That it's, it's everything. It's everything is, that's true. What you're saying is true. That life is just this, it's a process of getting where we need to be. And then when it's over, we're over. Our life is over. So it's, to wrap your mind around it takes a lot. I don't even know if we're capable of it, but but it's that simple. At the end of the day, it's that simple. Even though we can't wrap our heads around it. Right. So tell me about the relationship that Shlomo had in his uh, few months with his sister, Sarah. Ah, uh, that's actually especially difficult for me because they were completely in love with each other. <laughs> She was just so doting and loving. I would take care of him. And I have like videos of her just, you know, motioning for me to give her, you know, his, his burp cloth to so she could wipe his face off. She was just like, she loved taking care of him. She loved playing with him. She would wake up in the morning and just run to him. Shlomo, good morning. Good morning. Momo, good morning, Momo. And just give him hugs and kisses and pat his cheek and just, and he would just give her these huge smiles. It was so cute. It was so special for me. People would ask me, oh, how is the adjustment to two kids? Some people say it's the hardest adjustment. People were very busy telling me that, you know, from one to two, huge adjustment. And I said, you know, actually, no one told me how delicious it is. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I felt so blessed. I had this family. Now we were a family, like a real one. You know, we had our little girl and our baby boy and it just felt so right. So, so, so what happened after Shavuos? Okay. So it was... How, how old was Shlomo? Shlomo was 16 weeks old, nearly four months. And he was already a real person. I already knew what he liked. He was like, he was like a little man, you know, didn't like being hungry. He loved the bath. He loved being like warm and cozy and even though we live here for a few years, we, we keep two days of Yom Tev. Yeah, so, so you're saying even though the people in Israel traditionally only observe one day of the holiday, because you consider yourself still American, 
the halacha is that you keep two. Correct. Okay. So for in our surroundings, it was not, it was no longer the Chag, but for us it was. And uh, outside there was a procession for a new Sefer Torah to be led to a shul nearby. What does that procession look like? They make like a chuppah. There's a chuppah and people dancing and there's, you know, cars following with lights and, and, and children and hundreds of people just walking by to greet the new Sefer Torah and bring it to its new home. And I saw it passing by right outside. So I went downstairs with my sister-in-law and my, and the kids. She was here with us, my sister-in-law, Ellie. And we went downstairs together and we went outside with the kids and we were following it. And then we came back up and it was about seven o'clock. AJ had already left to go learn and daven. And, um, we came inside and I, you know, nursed him and I changed him and I was playing with him for a little bit. And at about eight o'clock, I put him in to bed and I came out and it was strange because he would usually cry and I would have to give him his pacifier six times before he actually fell asleep. And he went to sleep really nicely. Like I even commented like, Hey, where's Shlomo went to sleep so nicely. And strangely, I didn't go in to check on him. At about nine o'clock, after we had already made Abdallah, we were, you know, starting to clean up and get ready for Shabbos because it was Thursday night. I went in, to, I put in Sarah, I put Sarah into bed and I decided to go in and check on him. And right away I saw that something was wrong because his, he was, he was facing downward and his face was like scrunched into the blanket. And I knew right away that something was wrong because he should have picked up his head and moved it to the side. So I quickly turned his face and he didn't respond. And I started screaming and I pulled him out and I said, Shlomo, Shlomo, wake up, wake up. And I'm thinking to myself, this can't be happening. I can't deal with this right now. I, my life is perfect. I don't, I can't deal with this right now. It can't be happening. And, um, I pulled him out and AJ ran over and I was just literally just trying to pump, pump his heart, trying to pump life into him because he has to wake up. He, he cannot wake up. He's perfect. He's my baby. We're, and, um, within a few minutes we had our house filled with like 20 paramedics and they were all trying to revive him. And we were sitting in the living room, just complete shock of what was going on. And, um, after about 40 minutes or so, they said, okay, we're going to take him to the hospital. And I remember just thinking to myself, why are we taking him to the hospital? Like, what's going to happen? You've been here for 40 minutes. But they took him, uh, and we followed with my brother, Ellie, sister-in-law, Malki. They drove us to the hospital. And by that time, I already, like, really didn't have any hope that they were going to be able to save him. I just, I was even thinking to myself, like, just let him go. He has to go. Let him go. And um, we got there, and for another, I guess, half hour or so, they were, again, trying to revive him, resuscitate him. And then they finally came out and said, I'm sorry, we weren't able to save him. And then uh, we started working on funeral arrangements. You know, it's just amazing about life is that you don't know what's going to be from one minute to the next. We think life is a promise. It's not a promise. It's We have it today. We don't know what's going to be tomorrow. We don't know what's going to be in five minutes from now. And that was this feeling of like utter... helplessness, inability to know what, you have nothing to hold on to, nothing to hold on to. So they asked us if we want to go in and say goodbye to him. So for a minute, we weren't sure if we wanted to. And I said, you know what, AJ, if we don't go in now, we're going to regret it. So we went into the room. By that time, he already, he already didn't look alive. I just you suddenly realize what it means that the soul that God puts inside of us is what 
gives us life because it wasn't there. It wasn't him. I saw his body, but it wasn't him anymore. And we said Shema with him. We sing Hamalach Agoa. And I don't allow him. And we put him to sleep. And we let him go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and um, by the time they were trying to make all the arrangements and getting everything together and figuring out we would be buried. They weren't sure if they would be able to bury him that night. Sorry. <laughs> or if we would have to wait till the morning. And I looked around and I said, I'm such a child, such a soul that came into the world in a flash and left the world in a flash. He's not going to wait till the morning. They're going to bury him tonight. And five minutes later, they got the go ahead. And the funeral was set for one thirty in the morning. Early Friday morning. Early Friday morning. How many weeks after you were having those contractions, middle of the night? <laughs> yeah, exactly 16. Exactly 16 weeks later. Yeah. So there were about 60 people there. And AJ spoke by the funeral. Incredibly, incredibly. We were all so moved. It was... You didn't exactly have tons of time to prepare. Not exactly. (laughs) I think it was a very beautiful way to send him off. And, um... What was that, what was that night, the rest of that night like? Ah, awful awful we came back home and you know someone else had been here we had neighbors here doing our dishes and cleaning up and we came and there was just um there's a tradition that once the body is buried the family sits down and has a meal with bread and and eggs which are round they symbolize the circle of life so you know we sat down (laughs) and uh, low chairs, and we ate this meal. It tasted like sawdust. You know, we just couldn't even believe it. We couldn't even, we, we couldn't even process what we were doing. It was just so surreal. So that was like a middle of the night, like at two in the morning? That was, yeah, probably about two, two thirty in the morning. And we had to, uh, call our parents. We had to wait till, the Chag was going to be over in New York, which was at about 4.15. So we like set an alarm as if we were going to sleep. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we obviously didn't manage to fall asleep, but at four o'clock we called our parents. We we're just, even though we knew we couldn't, they couldn't even pick up the phone yet. We were just calling and calling and calling. <laughs> What was that conversation like? Oh, it was just... That's the last phone call you ever want to make. <laughs> ever. Or one receive. Or receive, that's for sure. But it was... Uh, I knew I should probably speak to my father instead of my mother. And it just took him a few times for me to tell him, for him to process what I was saying. Like, get on the phone, he picks up the phone, and... And I said... I said, Abba, Sh- Sh- Shlomo had to go back to Hashem. And he said, what? What are you talking about? And I, I literally just had to say, Shlomo died. <laughs> Shlomo, what? And I hear him in the background, what? Shlomo Niftar? And then in the back, all I hear is just sobbing. And just it was just such... You know, I don't, who wants to cause that pain to their own parents? Not me. It's just the worst nightmare. The worst nightmare. That's what it is. 
And then uh, the following morning, you began your, your shiva. Yeah, so uh, we did ask that people should have visited us on Friday, just because we, we needed time to just be alone and to process it ourselves. So very few people came. We had a, a man who was visiting from the States, from the five towns, who lost his son 10 years ago, so very suddenly. And his other son at the time was very sick. He since then passed away as well. And uh, the Rosh Hashiva of the Mir came. Rabbi Finkel and his wife. So we had a few visitors on Friday. But we really just wanted to be alone and to be able to process it on our own. But then after Shabbos, people started coming. So we sat Shivan. Let's see, Shabbos and Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we got up on Thursday morning. Hundreds of people came, hundreds, every day. I think there was maybe one time that no one was sitting there with me during our hours. Maybe one time. Well, what were the hours like? Uh, when, when they start coming? Uh, they had Shacharis here at maybe 8 o'clock, was it? And then we, and then I sat down at 9 till maybe 1 or 2, and then we started again at, I think we had three different times, so with a break for lunch and for dinner, and then we sat till maybe 9.30 or 10 o'clock. 10, 12 hours a day. Yeah. And people are here the whole time. The whole time. Non-stop. What are you telling them, or what are they telling you? I don't think it's a mistake that God chose us to be the parents of this of this child who had to be here for so short. I don't think it means that we're special or amazing or incredible, as people love to think, but I do think that it means that he wants something more for, uh, from us, something bigger from us. So I was definitely trying to figure out what that is. Tap into it. Even though so it is, I mean, we're still going through it. I don't say what we went through. I say what we're going through because every day is still a challenge. It still seems so fresh and raw. But even though so much of it is dark and unknown, I feel like there is always, when we're able to look at it that way, there's a certain clarity. There's a certain clarity of knowing exactly what, like you said, what our, our purpose is. And, and that a life well lived means that a person came to this world, did what they had to do, and went back up more pure. So we were trying to give ourselves the strength to be able to see that. And, uh, I would say for the most part, people were very sensitive, very caring. There were a few people who made up for it. Who who's who who said ridiculous things or things that were extremely unhelpful? Those people were well intentioned, just misinformed. I hope well intentioned, <laughs> <laughs> but certainly misinformed. That's for sure. Yeah, or giving suggestions of why it happened, or maybe it was because of vaccines, or maybe it was because of this or that, and. That's not what you need then, or ever. Or ever, yeah. It was intense, but it was very important. So, so you have four or five days here of nonstop foot traffic, people coming by the hundreds uh, to visit you and AJ and to help yeah. you mourn and grieve. Yeah. I want to read uh, a letter that you wrote and that you hung up on the bulletin board in your building. So this this is a letter that you wrote during the shiva. Uh, yeah, I wrote it. I think on let's say Shabbos. Right after Shabbos. Right after Shabbos. So you still haven't had tons of people here. Right. And this you hung up in. Uh, in uh, we hung it up right out the door. Oh, on the right door. Right outside the door. Okay, on the door. To all our dear neighbors, family, and friends. We would like to thank all of you for your kindness and concern throughout this tremendously difficult time. And I'm just going to translate the Hebrew words into English. We merited to host 
a beautiful and pure soul for exactly 16 weeks before the Almighty decided that it was time to bring him back up to heavens. Shlomo brought us so much joy. His smile lit up our entire world and filled our home with so much goodness. We've given much thought to how to give our baby Shlomo's soul and a spiritual ascension, a pure, perfect soul returned to its maker as the holiday of Shavuos came to a close. We would like to ask each of you to accept upon yourself, to commit yourself to increase some matter of holiness, be it in the purity of speech, regarding your eyes, ears, or mind, a small manageable commitment in the merit of Shlomo Alava Shalom Ben Avram Yochanan Neriyari Shlita so that his soul will soar yet higher and be an advocate for all of the Jewish people. Again, we sincerely appreciate the outpouring of kindness and love and means the world to us. May we merit to greet Messiah speedily in our days together signed A.J. Nestor. When did you decide to write this letter? And why? And sometimes in life, we're kind of on auto drive. We just like go and we kind of forget about certain things or our purpose or our goals or who we are. And then I think sometimes God kind of give us, gives, gives us a, sh- a shove to remind us. It's those times that have the biggest impact on us. So at that time, I was having these feelings so strongly. And I felt like I was in a position where I could share it with those people who care for us, who were coming to be with us at that time. You just felt like you're being moved to, you have to write this letter, and because you're, you're so present. Yeah, it was a time of huge clarity. Like I said, even though... It seems so dark and unbelievable because we don't know what goes on in the upper spheres and we can't know because we're on this side. But it was a certain clarity of vision of, wait a second, this is life. This is it. This is how it goes for all of us. So Shlomo had a shorter cycle. Some of us have it longer, but it's all the same thing. We all came from the same place and we're going to go back to the same place. What are we going to put in between? I want to I want to switch gears here and I want to talk about, you know, from the other side. So you had hundreds of people here visiting you and I'm sure many of them, maybe even most of them don't really know what to say to a parent who lost their child at 16 weeks. Like wh- what are you supposed to say? So my question is just from the other side. You know, I'm sure a lot of people you like you mentioned earlier, a lot of people say some really, really dumb things, uh, really insensitive things. But I, I imagine that they weren't trying to be hurtful; they just didn't know what to say. So maybe you know you could you could help the audience by telling them like, what does a mourning parent want to hear and needs to hear, and what does a mourning parent not want to hear? And absolutely should not be told. So we've been on the other end for most of our lives. And in one second, we suddenly came to this place of like, you know, we're the ones that people are t- talking to and saying these things to. We're not saying these things to. I think that everyone's different because I've spoken to other grieving mothers and I, and I do see that everyone's different. I even see with myself. Sometimes what works for me for one mi- minute and is helpful to me, the next minute is not helpful at all. So it for sure varies and there is no set rule. The one thing that I think is almost unanimous that a parent doesn't mind and appreciates hearing is I'm thinking of you. You know, you could say it with words, you could say it with a card, you could say it with, you know, something else, a gesture, but I think that that is, um, the nicest thing for us to hear because you don't want anyone to say, I understand you because no one understands you. You don't want anyone to say it's going to get better because right now it doesn't feel good. 
But when people say, I'm thinking about you, it just helps you feel that you're not alone. So I know for me, that's usually something that I, I really appreciate hearing. I really appreciate that. So not to say it's going to get better. Not to say it's going to get better. No, don't make me promises. You know, other people will say, oh, you'll have more kids. And to me, that doesn't even, that, that's not even relevant because, because what, what does it have to do with it? I miss Shlomo. I want Shlomo. I'm not talking about other kids now. I love Sarah and I love Shlomo and they're both my kids. And I, and I doesn't, and I, I realize that every child that's born has a new, gives you a new place, has a new place in your heart. They open up a new place in your heart. So when that child, if that child is gone, that place is still empty. You know, even if it'll be, you'll have another child and you'll get another piece in your heart. It's still, that child's part is empty. So it's like comforting someone who had their right shoulder lopped off. Say, well, you have your left arm, right? How bad is it? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, uh, not helpful. Not helpful. Was there anything particular that someone said here during the week of Shiva that really resonated with you and really, really hit the mark that you can remember? Uh, you know, it's, I think the people who said the least that affected me the most. I had a classmate from high school. I never even had that much to do with her. We both live here. So, you know, we see each other. We will schmooze for a few minutes and she came in. I don't even think she said one word. She sat here and cried and then she got up and left and it meant so much to me because she really felt with me. It wasn't as much what she said as what she didn't say that affected me. You felt that she was there with you in your pain yeah. a little bit. It happens to be that this particular person would still does call me up every now and then and she says, Hey, I'm thinking about you. How you doing? Wow. So special. You just realize that it's a, a unique individual who's able to tap into another person's pain when they don't, they have no reason to have to, she doesn't have to, she could go enjoy her own life, but that's, that's a special person. Mm. Was there, was there some particularly egregious, a uh, statement or that someone said during the Shiva that you think maybe would highlight what not to say? Oh, I had a woman walk in here. She was a stranger. She walked in and there were, there must have been 15 women sitting here. And the way, the way it was set up, it was very like long and narrow across the room. And she sits at the end on the couch. And I acknowledged her because the tradition is that the person who comes in doesn't speak until the person who's sitting Shiva greets them. So I acknowledged her and she starts saying, yeah, I have a very difficult life and my parents both died in different strange ways and it was very famous. And then I also had a baby who died last year and she just starts talking about her own story and her own grief and what I may have done wrong. And did I give him vaccines? Because that's, you know, could be a really big cause of this. She, she was totally crazy. She was totally crazy. And everyone is just sitting there gaping. They just couldn't believe it. Every word that came out of her mouth was dumber than the next. And I, I felt so angry. I was I was literally like shaking. And next to me, actually, at that time, was sitting a young woman who just recently lost her father very suddenly. And she leans over to me and she whispers, it's like a dagger in your heart that she keeps twisting, right? And that was such an accurate way to describe what was going on. And I was just thinking to myself, why don't, why doesn't someone just pick her up and shove her out the door? <laughs> but I have to say that she was really one of a kind. It, most people were very respectful and sensitive and, and supportive. Mm -hmm. And uh, also family members came in. Yeah. So my in-laws came in for two days and then they ended up extending their ticket for a third day and my mother came in I had a brother come in I had 
A few sisters-in-law came in just literally for one day each to be there with us, just to be there with us. That was very special for us too. Especially because, you know, these are people who also knew Shlomo and he also meant something to them. And that meant a lot for us. So, you know, many times when people are sitting Shiva, let's say for a parent or something like that, you have, you have brothers, sisters, parents, ch- children, grandchildren, people around. And it was just us. It was just AJ and myself sitting there alone. So it really meant a lot for us to have the support of our families. And I do have to give a shout out to our families anyway for also just being so good to us, giving us whatever we need, wanting to know exactly what we need, calling us to see how we're doing, listening to us, crying with us. It really not only makes a difference, but it helps us cope with our grief. So thank you. So so what's it like after after Shiva? After Shiva, there's no more people coming in, or maybe there's still a few people, but a trick roll instead of a torrent. And then you have to kind of piece your life together. Yeah. We're still working on that part. <laughs> no, it definitely becomes less less of a whirlwind. After a few months, it kind of, the dust kind of settles a little bit and you get into a rhythm, even if you still have to get used to it and we still have to adjust and I still, you know, want to smell his blanket. It's very traumatic. It's a very traumatic experience. And every night, you know, going into bed without our baby and waking up without him is very difficult. And I'm always waiting for a sign, always waiting for him to maybe come to me in a dream you know, talk to me. I want to see his face again. It's very hard. I miss him terribly. I think that's the lasting, that's the, the part that's always the most painful. I think at some point it becomes less of a matter of discussion, you know, because what's there to say? There's nothing left to say, but it becomes a scar on my heart. I'm always carrying him with me. Always, always. I go out to the grocery. I'm always thinking about him. I'm always missing him. I'm always, he's always lacking in, in my physical world. Sometimes I walk out and I feel like people are nervous to approach me. I feel this more frequently than not. People are nervous to approach me. They're nervous to say anything because they don't want to say anything stupid. And I understand them because I've been on that side many, many times. In fact, an interesting lesson that evening when I was coming home from that Hachnasa Sefer Torah, from the ceremony bringing the Torah to the new sh- to the shul, there was a woman outside, a neighbor of mine who had been due around the same time as me. She had a uh, and and she had a stillborn. It was really sad, and I remember thinking at that time. This is an hour and a half before my own baby passed away. I thought to myself. Oh, I feel awful. I have my baby and she doesn't have hers. And I didn't say anything. And afterwards, when I thought about it, I said, you know why she came outside? It must be to have been a lesson for me before, right before, literally so close. It couldn't have been closer to when I was going through this pain of my own. To show me that even I made this mistake, even I made this mistake, that I didn't say anything. I didn't say, and I was feeling it. I was feeling so sorry, but I was, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say because I felt so awful that I didn't say anything. So, so what would you advise yourself or someone in that situation right now? Like, what should they say in such a situation? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry if you're lost. I'm sorry about your baby. Even randomly. It's the middle of the day, randomly. Yes. Yes. She, she didn't forget about it. One thing that people should know is that. A parent doesn't forget their child, ever. If someone brings it up and thinks, oh, I don't want to make it painful for them. I don't want to make them sad. You're not making anyone sad. Trust me. Whatever's there is already there. It's already on our mind. It's already in our heart. You're not reminding us of anything. It's constant. It's with us. Do you think that there's not enough 
emphasis or education in the community about how to deal with bereaved individuals or bereaved parents or situations like this? I think it's it's a very emotional, very personal type of thing. I think parents vary in their reactions and what they want people to do. I happen to be a very open type of person and I appreciate when people ask me what I want. People ask me how they want them to approach it. Not everyone's like that. And besides for that, it's very difficult to do that. Only a very emotionally in touch, emotionally healthy person could go up to another person and say, listen, I want to do whatever you need me to do. What is that? It's a very difficult thing to say to another person. It really is. And I understand that. And I know that. So usually the smartest thing is on the, you know, silent end. But like I said, I I do think that I'm thinking of you or I'm sorry for you or even just a hug, you know, it it goes a long way. I think you usually don't, can't go wrong with that, even if there's nothing to do. Now, t- tell me about how things changed. So now we're nine months. So we spoke about the Shiva and the Shiva, you felt like you're being just guided, like you're just so clear what you need to do. But then after the Shiva and people stop coming and it's, it's slipping away, like you feel it's slipping away from everyone else's mind, but it's still fresh and raw for you. So, so h- h- how are things changing? Like, is there, is, do you notice something different like a month later or, or two months later or five months later? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? So grief is a very interesting process because it does have stages and, and it's interesting to see myself going through the stages. You know, when I'm angry or when I'm sad or depressed or just feeling it or feeling hopeful. There are all stages of it. And what I told myself right away is that I'm not going to force myself to do anything or feel anything for a year. A full year, no rules. And I'm, I'm grateful that I had that insight because I think that's the right way to approach it. I think God put into this world this grieving process. That's the way it's supposed to be. Yes, you're sad. Feel sad. You're angry. Feel angry. D- don't, don't try to resist. No. No, it's part of it. You have to go through it in order to get through it and get past it. And I, I do feel like it's a spiral. You know, you keep going, you go around to the same thing, but every time it's different. You come around to that sadness, but the next time it's a little bit of a different sadness. It's different. It's not in ways it gets easier. In what ways? Uh, say, It becomes more routine, I would say. Um, I'm not waking up in the morning feeling around for him. Where is he? Where's Shlomo? But it's still that that tug that I miss him. I miss him more every day. One of our brothers had traveled to the States for a few days, and he came back, and I said, you know, how much did you miss your kids? You need to be there. They're your kids. You you need them. So so we miss him. We miss him more each day. So what about what about you personally, you and your husband? Like how have you changed or how has this tragedy has it affected your 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 life, your perspectives, uh this what decisions did it impact? Like do you feel like you've grown in certain areas as a result? Yeah, I definitely think that we've become stronger, stronger in our faith, stronger in our beliefs that that we're going to see a redemption, that the soul is eternal, that God runs the world, divine providence, everything's preordained, it's a bigger picture becomes part of our daily mantra and part of what we tell ourselves every day because we're living it. So definitely becomes truer. And um, 
Yeah, also on how precious life is. It's so precious. How important it is to love our love our family. Our children, our spouses. Like this is it. We're irreplaceable to them and they're irreplaceable to us. I think there's no no bigger greatness than trying to do the best we can to be the best we can. Try to figure out what it is that God wants us to learn. And I think it's true. I think actually we spoke to our rabbi and he told us this and it really resonated with me. He said, God is not cynical. He's not out to get you. He wants to educate you. And that's why sometimes when he tests you, it's in the areas that it's the hardest. Not because he's laughing at you, but because he's, that's, that's where he wants you to grow. So I think that's true and it gives a good perspective on it that we're on the same team. He wants the best for us. He wants good for us. It also helped me in many ways to try to let go. You know, we try to be in charge of things or try to be on top of things. And I kind of, not even fully consciously, but even subconsciously started telling myself, okay, you know what? doesn't matter. What gets done gets done. What doesn't, doesn't. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. We do the best we can. We leave the rest up to God. And it, I think in that way, really, my life has changed, really. And then, of course, just, you know, in the day-to-day life, it's it's different. You walk out, you're in a different sphere of people. You know, so I always feel like I have to make myself approachable. <laughs> and uh, and I and I do want to be approachable. I want to be normal. But uh, even if circumstantially I'm not, I don't want people to relate to me weirdly or differently because I am still me. What did you uh, What did you tell Sarah? Like, how does she, how does she process this? I think children are amazing, incredible individuals. I think they're, they have a very simple faith, I think. Um, she woke up the next morning and right away she says, Shlomo, good morning, Shlomo. And she's about to run into the room and I'm like, my heart literally was like caught in my throat and I couldn't breathe. And I'm like, here we go. <sighs> I tell myself, Esther, this is the moment you have to tell your daughter that her brother's not coming back home. It's just the most terrible thing. You know, here we are four months ago. We gave her the most amazing gift of a sibling and he's gone. He's not coming home now. I sat her down and I said, Sarah, I said, Sarah, Shlomo went up to Hashem and Shemayim. So that's what I said. I just said, that God took him back and, and she accepted it without, without question, without a word. It was like, okay. I sometimes wonder what, what's going on inside of her. Is she, is it more complicated than I think? I don't know. I really don't know. Do you still speak to her about it? Yes. All the time. All the time. She wants to see pictures of him. I want to see Sarah and Shlomo. She wants to see videos of him. And and I want to show it to her because I want him to always be a part of our lives. He is. He's a part of our family. He was taken from us, but he's still part of our family, always. I see that uh, you, you you put pictures all over your house of Shlomo. Yeah. I would imagine that uh, some people maybe would have the opposite inclination. Yeah. But mm-hmm. you... You feel like it's it's better for you to not to not remove him from your mind from your life. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think it, it's very important for us that he should be always be a part of our home and of our family. He's taught us a lot, even in his death. And besides, for that, we feel like he's our he's our angel angel watching us from above. We really feel like that. So. Yeah, we're always going to have 
whatever we can, whatever remnants we can have of him in our home. So what would you say to someone who wants to help and not in the immediate aftermath of tragedy, but later on, you know, months later, maybe even years later, uh, people who are good intentioned and that they really care uh, about the well-being and the recuperation of, of, of those who suffer great loss. How would you advise them to navigate this? So I think it's very important for people to know that everyone grieves differently and everyone pains in a different way. It's also very important not to suggest that people do a certain thing or to give advice that's unsolicited. I think that's a key suggestion (laughs) that no one wants your opinion. Don't give your opinion. Sometimes for other people, people who, I'll say it personally, people who love us, they want the best for us. They don't like to see us in so much pain. They say, you know, it's hard for me to see in such pain. Maybe, you know, try to move on in this way or that way. Maybe try to. It has the opposite effect. That is, that's wrong for us. What's right for us is for someone to say, I'm here for me, for you, for whatever you need. You need anything, I'll be here for you. So what are the, some of the suggestions that you may have heard that r- rubbed you the wrong way? Or So uh, one example is we had um, a family friend who had visited in Israel. Mind you, we never heard from her during Shiva. She never called us or contacted us or tried to reach out to us. And uh, one day we got an email forwarded from three other people that she had contacted a friend of hers who was, was a therapist here in Jerusalem. And she said, oh, you know, we have family friends who had just lost a child. And, you know, would you be willing to see them or to talk to them, to counsel them? And uh, she had responded, the therapist had responded, you know, oh, so nice to see you care for them. Have her reach out to me. Now, she forwarded this to someone who forwarded to someone else who forwarded it to a family member who sent it to me. Now, this was, I understand, very well intentioned. You know, she really just wanted to do the right thing and help us through this. But that was not in any way helpful. She didn't show us that she cared. She didn't do anything to show us that, you know, it was on her mind or that, she wanted to help us out or that she was thinking of us. She took into her own hands what she thinks we need. So that was really uh, actually a shock for us and very upsetting to us. It wasn't, it wasn't empathetic to us and to, to what we were going through, but it was more like, okay, problem, solution. Problem, you're in pain. Solution, let's find a way to get rid of the pain. Pain doesn't work like that. It's, it's more than just an emotion, more than just a feeling. It's a state of being. It's very deep and very great. And there's no reason to try to get rid of it or to have someone else get rid of it. Because life doesn't work like that. I always quote from from uh, the episode where where Abraham's wife Sarah dies. And uh, she was 127 year old. She wasn't exactly uh, a young woman. Mm-hmm. And even though Abraham, if anyone understood like the psychological or philosophical dimensions of loss and tragedy, it would be Abraham, you know, the, the titan of, of philosophy. Uh, yet what does he do? He eulogizes her and he cries. You would think, well, well, well if, if there's a problem, if there's pain, solve the pain, right? Deal with it on a more immediate level. But no, Abraham f- addresses, as we, if Abraham needs to do it, we, of course, should do it, the, the emotional aspects, the, 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 talking about the loss and grieving and crying and dealing with everything else at a later point. And I always say the Torah tells us that story. I'm sure there's a lot of people who had eulogies and mornings and, and burials and the like, but it tells us the story with Abraham to remind us that 
we too, if Abraham needs to have this period of suffering and emotion and dwelling on the pain and crying and eulogizing, that is the way it has to be for everyone. So looking, looking for solutions to try, to try to solve the pain or to eradicate the pain or to avert the pain, that's not helpful. Right. I want to talk about some of the plans that you have or things that you've done to try to memorialize Shlomo. I understand there's some sort of big campaign that was undertaken to donate something in his memory. You want to talk about that? Sure. So uh, maybe it was a few weeks after Shiva, I got a call from my close friend, Dahlia, and she said, you know, I was there at the Shiva on Sunday and I, I saw that there – there wasn't all the all the equipment that you needed for a Shiva house, such as a Sefer Torah, to read from the Torah Mondays and Thursdays. It wasn't available yet. It wasn't there, and no one knew how it was going to get there. And I thought to myself, you know, where's there's an organization in New York called Miss Askim, and they provide all these things for Shiva houses. And she said, where's Miss Askim? And she called them up, and they said, uh, well, we only deal with uh, the situations in the United States, but why don't you give a call to Zaka? Who's the search and rescue team in Israel? They sh- they should have more information for you. And she called up Zaka, and they said, "Well, actually, we have warehouses all over Israel that contain all the equipment that you need for a shiva house, but it- people have to come pick it up on their own." And she said, "You mean people have to come with a van or a truck and pick it up on their own?" They said, "Yep, that's just we don't have money for a truck." She said, "Well, what if I raise money for a truck for you?" And they said, "Great." <laughs> If you raise money for a truck, we'll hire a full-time driver to go across Israel wherever needed and deliver deliver and pick up equipment. And she spearheaded this incredible campaign to raise $140,000 for this truck. And believe it or not, she was successful. This is like so crazy for a family run campaign not you know with no uh major people behind it until actually um a, a donor came up and said you know if you raise the first 70,000 I'll give you this the second 70 and it was incredible incredible hundreds and hundreds of people donations coming in you know, ten dollars, fifty-four dollars, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. It was unbelievable. So much love, so much care, and uh, we're really grateful. And it should actually be up and running really, really soon. This is going to be a truck, like a mobile truck, to go provide the paraphernalia and equipment for shiva homes. Yes. So, like chairs and 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 books and prayer books and a Torah scroll and everything that way a couple or a family that experiences tragedy, at least they shouldn't have to run around the neighborhood to try to assemble all the things needed to mourn properly. Yeah. And that's going to be done in memory. In memory of Shlomo. In memory of Shlomo Kaplan. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, besides for that, there was someone who, during Shiva, I'm not sure if it was because of our letter. I don't know. Perhaps it was, but they put up a sign. I didn't even know who it was till afterwards. Uh, they put up a small sign and it said, if you're willing to accept upon yourself a small resolution in honor and memory of Shlomo, please write your name down. And people wrote their initials. And I think we had, I don't know, maybe a hundred people wrote their initials down on there. And I remember just looking at that page and my eyes welled up with tears. I couldn't believe it. This is, these are people who, you know, we were close to or not close to who came in and were, inspired and moved and said, you know what? Here's a child who didn't have a chance to do mitzvot on his own during his lifetime. I'm going to do something for him. It was very special, meaningful to us. Very. I want to end uh, with a song that uh, someone in the family made up about Shlomo. And uh, I'm going to read the words. But uh, amazingly powerful words and song that, that, that capture a little bit of, of the story of Shlomo Kaplan. Uh, you entered this world. You were born in a flash. We'd hoped you'd be with us forever. Our precious boy, you filled our lives and suddenly you were called up from high. Your shiny blue eyes, your smile that won hearts, your laughter that brightened our moods. We watched you grow with sheer delight and suddenly were found in the darkest night. O Shlomo, 
No words can describe the joy that you brought to our lives. You made us complete. Those short days were so sweet, living on in our hearts and minds. We yearn to embrace you yet again as we wait for this exile to end. Our dear Shlomo, we'll stay strong because we know you're right next to the throne of Hashem. Tell me about this song. Every night when I put our daughter Sarah to sleep, I like singing her songs along with Shema that I sing to her. I like singing her songs. And those first few weeks after Shlomo passed away, and I'm thinking that's all on my mind. That's the only thing that's on my mind. And I thought to myself, there's nothing that could covers what I'm feeling. You know, as Jews, we sing Ani Ma'amin. I believe. I believe. I believe that God runs the world. I believe that God will bring the redemption. I believe that... But it wasn't covering it. It wasn't enough. I needed something more. So I called up my incredible sister-in-law, Malki, and I said, Malki, she's talented with words and with songs and music. And I said, I need a song for Shlomo. And... um she called me back a week or two later and she said, I don't know, maybe it's too emotional. Maybe I said, am I going to cry? She said, probably. I said, then it's perfect. <laughs> and uh, the first time she sang the song to me, I I was in a heap of tears. And then I spent the next morning, the entire morning, learning it and just sobbing my brains out. I just, it just was perfect. It was exactly what I needed. And interestingly enough, the, the, the tune for the song is from the words in Deuteronomy, uh, talking about the mitzvah of sending a mother bird away and taking her, the eggs or the chicks. And when I thought about that, my husband AJ told me, you know, it's very interesting that it's, that it's, uh, you know, to those words. He said, that's kind of what happened here. You know, when you happen upon a nest of a mother with a, a young chicks or eggs, you send the mother away and then you take the chicks or the eggs. And then you'll have a long, beautiful life. And then he said, that's what God did. He sent you away and he took your chick and you'll have a long, beautiful life. <laughs> Asta, thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. <laughs> thank you for having me. And, it's a uh, privilege. <laughs> And we hope that the Almighty gives you comfort amongst all the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. And together with uh, your amazing husband, AJ, uh, you'll have a long and robust and healthy life. And with uh, Sarah and your whole family, and we're really happy to have you in our family. And uh, thank you so much for inspiring so many people. Thank you. And taking this this loss and sharing these amazing lessons and insights and inspiration with everyone. It's a pleasure. <laughs> oh, thank you.